Thank you for, for having me, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests. I'm going to talk about the idea of cradle-to-cradle -cradle oceans. And what I mean by that is the idea of thinking of human interactions with the oceans as something that relates from the beginning to the end, to the beginning, to the end, and it's endless, cradle to cradle. Now, I, my ancestors are Irish, and in ancient Ireland, the salmon was the most sacred of creatures because it was born in the rivers, it went out to sea, and it returned to where it was born, cradle to cradle. And this idea that things are born on land and go to sea and come back is a part of the theme of this because I've been asked to talk about a strategy for how to deal with plastics for seven billion people for the coming centuries. That is what I'm about to talk about. Now this is a carbon question because for climate change we worry about carbon in the atmosphere gone fugitive and it becomes a liability, it's a toxin, a material in the wrong place at the wrong dose and the wrong duration is a poison. We also see that because of climate change, the atmosphere is now contaminating the, the oceans with acidification. But there's another one. It is carbon in the form of a durable solid, plastics, in the ocean. This is carbon too, and this is what we do. So if design, and that's what I do, I'm a designer, if design is the first signal of human intention, what is our intention? Do we intend to put millions of pounds of plastic in the ocean every year? Is that our plan? If that's not our plan, it's become our de facto plan because it's the thing that's happening because we have no other plan. So where's the plan? So how do we do this as a designer? Well, we have to start with who we are and how we think and how we behave. And it starts here at the beginning of plastics in society. This is 1955. Life magazine, the cover story. Throw away living. Disposable items cut down household chores. Poof! Welcome to the age of plastics. It's the graduate plastics. And we used to throw things away, throw away culture. Where is away? Can somebody tell me where that is? Away has gone away. When we saw the Earth from outer space, we realized this is home. There is no away. So, what we've done with Cradle to Cradle is realize there's two cycles and metabolisms that humans can interact with. One is the biological system, and that has waste equals food. One thing's waste is another thing's food. We eliminate the concept of waste. This isn't minimize avoid, it's eliminate the concept of waste. If we do that with the things that humans make, we've been, ever since we started banging on metal, We've created a technical metabolism of things that we use, but the problem is we use them and then we throw them away. Where is away? And then we also talk about the life cycle of things. We say, what's the life cycle of this television set? Well, it's not a living thing. We should talk about it as a use cycle. When I finish with the use, what's the next use? These are objects of human artifice for human usefulness. The plastics are to be used. And why are the students so upset about single-use plastic? Why? Single-use? Really? So, one of the big questions when plastic bags arrived in the United States was paper or plastic? Which is better? So they did the first famous life cycle assessment, paper versus plastic. And they concluded that they couldn't compare chlorine and trees and rivers with, with hydrocarbons converted into polymer from an ecological effect, so they decided that plastic is better because it uses less space. Because in the end, in the United States, it will go to a landfill. And therefore, if it takes less space, that's better. That's how we decided it in our country. But how do we decide it for the planet? Paper or plastic, same question. This one, plastic uh, uh, or planet. So. What does the turtle think? When is the last time you saw a sea turtle being strangled by a paper bag? If we think about the nature of the plastic and what it means to be marine degradable, as well as what it means to be usable, we realize we move from this set of words that we used to use. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Fine. Reduce, reuse, recycle. But now, 
and we're developing this with the European Commission, the terms are reusable, recyclable, compostable. And so I work with big companies. I work with Walmart. I work with Unilever. We're developing reusable, recyclable, compostable strategies. The problem is, is it recoverable? Just because it's recyclable, what if we, do we get it back? That bag the turtle was wrestling with is recyclable. But guess what? It's a material in the wrong place, at the wrong dose, and the wrong duration. That is, by definition, a toxin. So, if we look at the United States, this is the garbage in the United States. Here are the flows. These are the technical materials. These are the biological materials. Do they go back to nature? Do they go back to industry? No. They get discarded. They either go to landfills or incinerators. That is what happens. Wrong materials, wrong place, wrong dose, wrong duration. So I think we need a new language of plastics. And so today, I'm so excited to be here because this is an organization and an event. And why are we here? We're here to talk about how to design for seven billion people for generations and centuries. What a fantastic framework of question for the work. So this is the language of plastic today. We have seven main types of plastic. But what we're forgetting is that polyvinyl chloride, when burned, produces cancer or in pyrolysis systems produces hydrochloric acid and corrodes all the equipment. That must go. That has to go. Then what, what else? We have new biodegradable materials coming, and we don't even know what to do with them or how to integrate them into existing systems. If we look at design, my world, look at this. These are the 25 award-winning packages. Not one, not one is recyclable, reusable, or compostable. Not one. So the design community has some work to do. This is New York City's garbage. Surprise, surprise, look at the bright big pink bars. Which were the big ones? Shopping bags and plastic films. So this isn't about recycle your bottle. Look at this, the bottles are up there. Look at this, this is what we do. So this is in Chile and they're training the rag pickers to pick the different types of plastic, but only one. That red one there, PET, makes any money selling plastic because plastic bottles are actually resellable and people can handle that. We can mechanically recycle. They're thermosets. The others are thermoplastics. So they're doing their best to sort them and they've actually developed re recyclability indexes that we're working with them on. And it shows that the materials are not recyclable. They're just not. And so we end up, especially when we think of Indonesia, or Thailand, or China right now, we end up with this. We end up with this. Durable carbon gone fugitive. And what are we supposed to do with it? It's an undefined system. So it seems very clear. We can recycle mechanically, tear it up, put it back together, bottles, polyethylene terephthalate. The rest of this stuff, polystyrene, poly, polypropylene, um, polyethylenes, we can chemically recycle them. Let's take it all together, let's take it back to oil. Take it back to the source. Bring it back up the river. Take it back to where it was born. Get it out of the ocean. And, and on land, we can do the same. So this means we chemically recycle it. It's a term you will learn and learn to love. We can take it back to core. And then paper and cellulose and so on, we can use those safely for paper. We can make things with them that are safe. And what happens, we mechanically recycle the polyesters, we chemically recycle all the other junk, and then we take the things that we can use to heal the soil, and we heal the soil. Oil comes from soil. It's ancient soil, time and pressure, ancient soil. We bring it back up to the surface, and we convert oil to soil. Think about this. This is a purification ritual for the planet. Now, we're here at a government summit, so what are the politics of this? Look, these are the bag bans in the world. Imagine, people are banning plastic bags. What is that? What is that instinct? Chile just came along, so on. But look at this. This is the United States. The black states, ready? We have banned bans. In those states, it's like very childish to think about it. It's ban, ban. We have banned bans. The states have said, no banning our plastic bags. We love our plastic bags. Well, of course we love plastic bags. They're light, they work really well, and so on. 
but only if they're in designed and coherent systems of reuse do they make any sense. And today it's gotten even more complicated because look at this. That's a biodegradable bag, but so is that. BSF has now created 100% compostable. We've done the science on it. Down to hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, all the way. But we have people talking about biodegradable bags that break down into microplastics. They're biodegradable, but they're not compostable. We want to heal the soil all the way, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. And then we have technical bags, and they're very confusing. Everybody's confused, what kind of bags? So this protocol we're talking about will solve for this. Now, people are worried about the oceans. Of course we are. And we see these gyres since Charles Moore, 15 years ago, went out and found six times as much plastic as plankton in the Pacific gyre. The next year, he found 80 times as much plastic as plankton in the Pacific gyre. And here we are, almost two decades later, saying, oh my goodness, it's piled up and it's huge, and it is, and there are five of them. But look at this. 40% of these plastics come from rivers. Of those rivers, 90% of it comes from those 10 rivers. So what we're looking at and proposing and developing the resources for is to go after those 10 rivers and go to the mouths of the rivers and collect it there because we can only go where it concentrates and we can move it, otherwise we can't provide value. Let's cut it off before it gets to the ocean while we try and clean up the ocean. And then let's move up, upland into the countries and try and help everybody in the world redesign plastics and flow. So where is the plastic coming from? China, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Egypt, Malaysia. Look, we go there. We start there. We go to these rivers. We go to the mouths of the rivers. We cut it off. You stop the bleeding into the oceans while we work on the oceans. And we have island strategies. We have harbor strategies, river strategies, coastline strategies. We start here. And what do we do? We take whatever is being collected in the ocean, but it's contaminated with chlorine, barnacles and all kinds of things. Let's bring it in. It's very tough. You can't really manage it, but we'll do it. We can get that. And then we take it from the land, too, because if we don't take the land side, we don't solve the problem. And that's where the bulk of it is. And we need the bulk to dilute the ocean plastics because they're a contaminant. We need to put them in about 2 or 3%, and then we can handle it like that. So we need to heal the land in order to heal the sea. We want to use the sea to heal the land, the land to heal the sea. This is what it means to be cradle to cradle. And just this last slide, this is new. This just came out. Scientists have been analyzing the future of the plastics. And we've been looking at it. Look at this. Here we are today. 98% of plastics in the world are made from fossil sources. 98%. Look what we can do by 2050. By 2050, the scope of work here with governments doing this, your government and the government of America could say, this is where we're going. Look. We think that 70% of the bio-based polymers can be made from actual carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. 30% can, can be made from biological sources without damaging our food systems. But this giant piece of it will be done from recycling the old polymers into new refreshed, refreshed uh, oil, basically. We purify it. We take out the poisons, and we purify it, and we start over again. We hit the reset button, and that's what it looks like. So the design assignment is, is like Emerson said when asked, what is nature? He said, nature is all those things that are too big for humans to affect, to change. His examples were the oceans, the mountains, the leaves, the air. Welcome to the first industrial revolution. That didn't work. We can affect the oceans. We can affect the mountains. We can affect the air. So it's time for a new design. Let the mountains inspire the land and the oceans. Let the oceans inspire the land. Let us breathe clean air. And let's get to work, because this is going to take a really long time. But it's about that. So that is the point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. That was great. Thank you very much. Just to continue some of, some of the points that were brought up there, we're going to be talking about the oceans in particular now. I'd like to welcome to the stage Mr. Sanjay and the CEO of Conservation International. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Please take a seat. <laughs> right, so I just want to kick off. I mentioned that in my intro, you know, often we talk about climate change. The oceans, for some reason, can be left out of the conversation. So what, can you talk to us briefly about the importance of the oceans to the world and, and, and lay out why they're so crucial to, to be conserved? Thank you. Thank you, Arjun. And uh, thank you to uh, 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 the United, uh, United Arab Emirates and to Dr. Thani uh, for inviting us to, to be here. 
uh, most of the planet is oceans. We have, uh, we're a terrestrial species, and we've spent our time learning about conservation from land. But unless we take care of the oceans in the long run, the blue planet, which we're on, is fatally doomed. So I think it's time for us to put the amount of effort that we're putting on land in the sea and then to double it. So, so to that point, the conservation community r recently made a big call to, to protect 30% of the ocean by yeah. 2030. Yeah. Why is 30% a crucial yeah, it's a number? That's good, a good and, question. And is it achievable as well? well that's the second <laughs> question. That's much harder. Yeah. So where did this 30% to protect the oceans come from? So it actually came uh, from a study that was published about two years ago in Conservation Letters. And uh, a, a famous professor, Robert McCullum, basically looked at over 100 studies that had been done on oceans. And he looked to see if there was any consensus in these studies about what it would take to protect the oceans in terms of connecting populations of fish, in terms of providing for humans, uh, in terms of creating enough space for biodiversity. And it turned out that there was some consensus, amazingly, even though these papers weren't correlated with one another, there was consensus that about 30% was what was needed. So that's where that number has come from. Now, the, the UN's goal is 10%, which is essentially doubling what we have today by 2020, which we won't obviously reach. But we do think that at least doubling it by, say, 2025 is very feasible. Is 30% achievable? I do think it is, but it's important to remember that doesn't mean that that 30% has no human interference. It means that those are effectively managed areas. You think about how much effort we take to manage or mismanage land, and then you ask, my gosh, we spend no effort at all in managing our oceans. So the idea behind the 30% target is to effectively manage and conserve um, the oceans. And the studies show that doing that will not only be good for wildlife and for the oceans, but will also be good for human development and human economies. So in an earlier part of the discussion with mm. President Fabius, President Espinosa, we were talking about this skepticism towards multilateralism, towards working together that has emerged. There's lack of consensus around these issues on a government level. Does that make your job yeah, so, much harder? It, well, it obviously it makes the job <laughs> harder. But here's the interesting thing about the oceans. There is a great deal that is being done by governments when it comes to oceans. This is an interesting thing. Somehow, something has turned. There's a switch has been turned off. And I'm seeing government after government being willing to make commitments on oceans. Brazil, Colombia, the Cook Islands, um, uh, Australia. You know, you know, if you went 20 years ago and asked, what are the countries that were doing something at scale when it came to the oceans? You had two examples. You had the United States and you had Australia. Today, well over 30, maybe more countries willing to um, think about conservation at scale on oceans. Here's the challenge. Even though these governments, like Costa Rica, like Colombia, are trying to do the right thing, there isn't enough science, capacity, support to make sure that they are successful. And it's really critical right now that we, all of us, businesses, communities, nonprofits, and governments, help these governments that are willing to commit to conserving their oceans. Even here in the United Arab Emirates, I mean, yesterday I had the opportunity to go diving in one of the sites that is a marine protected area. Um, we have well over, I, I believe, I'm going to say sort of 15%, 18% of the oceans, Dr. Thani, tell me if it's higher or lower, protected in the United Arab Emirates. Um, and we can, we can achieve and do more. So you've, you've laid out some of the challenges, of course, what are the opportunities? Where are the signs of hope right now? Are there some interesting projects you see going on that gives you hope that these targets that you, you uh, have and the conservation community have sure. can be reached? Sure. I'll give you two good examples mm. that I think are, are worthwhile thinking about. Indonesia, big ocean country, thousands of islands, very complicated political system and, and governance. In um, Papua, so the bird's head seascape, which is sort of like where Indonesia, where Papua sort of goes and becomes, it looks like a goose head. That area has the highest marine biodiversity in the world. Maybe the bi highest diversity in the world, not just marine. 
And the government has done, the local government and the, the provincial government, sorry, and the national government has done a pretty good job of putting in place efforts to protect it by taking the revenue that they generate from diving and putting it directly back into conservation. It doesn't go to the central government and it gets allocated out. It goes directly back into, into protecting that area and into creating economic opportunities for the people who live there. So that is seen as a shining model. Conservation International, but also the World Wildlife Fund and the Nature Conservancy and others have worked there for maybe 20 years. It's one of the few places that I've been to, say, 20 years ago and gone diving there, and I've been there two years ago, and there is a dramatic improvement in this incredible place. Another example, Colombia. Colombia just did something pretty amazing. They worked with Apple uh, and Conservation International to basically protect about 30,000 hectares of mangroves. Mangroves are... Um, forests that grow on the edge of oceans. There are a marine system or a terrestrial system, depending on how you look at it. They're incredibly important for fish and protecting coastlines, and they store carbon. Colombia did this, and it was a very cool deal. It was a blue carbon deal, basically taking the carbon there and essentially selling it, um, and in this case, Apple being the one stepping in to buy it. Look, we've got to wrap this up, unfortunately, but I no do worries. want to end on a practical point, yeah. like I did with the last panel. Can you give me uh, what you think are the necessary steps required to protect the oceans? What, what should be happening next? Sure. So I'll give you a couple uh, very quickly. So I think there is a unique opportunity right now. I think somehow, amazingly, because of great communications, because, because children are asking for it, because fishermen are asking for it, there is an opportunity across multiple countries to make a big leap forward in oceans. We have less than 5% of our oceans really protected. We genuinely believe that we can double it within the next, say, 10 years. That's about 18 million square kilometers of oceans. But the governments, their efforts will fail unless we are able to step in there and help them with enforcement, help them with technology, help them with science, help them with fisheries management basically giving communities an incentive to protect their resources. On plastics, um, I love what Bill had to say uh, and, and on all the other speakers. Um, it's a problem in the rivers as much as it's a problem in the oceans, and I think we're going to tackle that. Fantastic. Sanjay, thank, thank you, you so much for your time. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. <laughs>